Today I'm talking to co-founder Tina Sharkey about their new e-grocer venture Brandless, which only sells its own labels and is out there to democratize goodness. They do that by selling what they consider wholesome products at a $3 price, cutting out the brand tax, which to them is the traditional investment into advertising and retailer margins. Take a listen as we discuss the mission, soul, and truth of this new venture. And let us know what you think if you embark on your own brandless journey. Enjoy. Please listen carefully. Well, welcome everyone to this episode of the Uber Brands podcast, the podcast in which we discuss brands that are desired beyond price, performance, or reason. Brands that seduce rather than sell and add myth to the material. They shine from the inside out and we call them Uber Brands. And we, that is your host, JP Kuvan, and occasional co-host, Wolf Schaefer. And today I'm really excited to have Tina Sharkey with me. Hello, Tina. Hi there. So great to be here. It's great that you're here. Where, where are you calling in from, actually, Tina? I am in San Francisco, California, in the beautiful Presidio, right past the Golden Gate Bridge. And Tina is the co-founder of a brand called Brandless. Hold on for just a minute. We're going to explain. It's an online grocery store come retail brand where everything costs $3. Now, you're going to ask yourself, okay, what has that got to do with Uber Brands? It seems to be quite the contrary of what we usually talk about, which is branding and uh, on top of that premium branding but when i first heard the brandless story i was actually struck that brandless is a lot about brand building and in fact they're doing quite a few things like uber brand so i thought we're going to talk about that and maybe also draw out some of the contrasts with what uber brands are doing but enough me talking tina Tell us a little bit about yourself and then, of course, what is Brandless? Because it just started, I think, in July of this year, correct? It did, yes. Well, we've been planning the company for many years before that, but we officially launched to the world on July 11th. Um, so what is that, like 23, 24 weeks old? And we are really trying to make sense of modern consumption. We believe that there is this paradox of choice, there's overconsumption, and there's too much out there and the price that things cost to make versus the price that people are being asked to pay for them is completely out of sync. And the disparity between what people want for themselves and for their families versus what they can afford is growing every single day. So at Brandless, we are trying to eliminate all the inefficiencies that cause all of that markup and produce the most extraordinary non-GMO food, mostly organic, huge gluten-free collection, massive focus on vegan, organic uh, feminine hygiene, EPA Safer Choice certified cleaning. And all of our beauty and personal care products are rid of the 400 ingredients that you don't want in those things and are rich with incredible um, green tea and aloe and other collections, lavender soaps and incredible shave gels and organic cotton pads and cotton swabs and everything at Brandless, everything across personal care and beauty and cooking and cleaning and baking and housewares and stationery and office, everything is just $3. <laughs> Actually, I take it back. Some are two for three and some are three for three. Here we go. I can hear that you did more than one pitch for Brandless. And, but it, it, it sounds like an impressive list. It, it sounds like all the buzzwords. It's organic, no GMO. It's you know, free of harmful products, etc. Who's what we call the design target? Who is your Uber target here with these products? Who are you hoping to attract with this? So here's the crazy thing. Brandless was built for everyone under the like true deep-seated belief system that we have, which is that everyone deserves better. And honestly, like does better really need to cost more? And so we launched Brandless on July 11th. Within 60 hours, we had this crazy number show up and that number was 48. I was like, 48, honestly, really 48? 
And that referred to the 48 states that we already shipped to in the continental U.S., which is every state we could ship to because we can't yet ship, ship outside of that. So when you ask me who is Brandless for, Brandless is for people who are choosing organics and non-GMO, people who have what I would call a value system. Now, some of those values are like, hey, I want non-GMO food. Some of those values are, wait, I'm gluten-free. It's a dietary belief. Some of those beliefs are, wait, I want kosher, or I want organic, or I want vegan, or I want organic, I want um, uh, EPA Safer Choice certified. Like everyone has different filters for what they buy and how they buy it. The problem is those filters haven't led them to the ability to buy them either because they live in a food desert, they don't have access, or because they can't afford it because there's a premium on all those products. So Brandless is built for everyone that cares about what they eat, what they consume, and has a belief filter system against their purchasing, and they want access to things that are great for themselves and their families. So it's really every state, every person. Got you. Now, maybe for some of the listeners who might not be aware and haven't Googled in the meantime, can you just describe quickly the mechanics? Uh, it's an online store, right? Yes. Yeah, so everything that I described is only available at brandless.com. Mm -hmm. And when you go to brandless.com, you do not need to be a member. You can start shopping the minute you get there. Um, if you want to join Brandless, which is not required, you can join Be More, which is $36 a year. And if you use Be More, then shipping is free all the time. Okay, interesting. I mean, it, it sounds like a little bit like Amazon Prime there. Is that inspiration for you? Um, I would say that it's different than Amazon Prime and that Amazon's extraordinary, but Amazon, you know, if Brandless were really building a community, um, if you're talking about Be More, then yes, I would say that what we really want is people to be able to take advantage of all of the savings. On average, when you look at a brandless product, it's 40 to 50% less than a national brand of equal quality. So if you're comparing our organic peanut butter to a national organic peanut butter, or you're comparing our clean shampoo and clean conditioner or facial wash to another, you know, national beauty brand of similar quality, you're going to see a savings of 50. And in the case of beauty and personal care, sometimes over 300% off of those national brands. So what Be More is enabling you to do is have, you know, for three bucks a month, essentially, um, you're getting access to all of these goods anytime and really can start to shift your behavior to have brandless in your life. Okay. So, I mean, it seems like you're mission filled. In fact, I look at the website and you said we're a group of thinkers, doers, lovers of life with big dreams about changing the world. Is that a little bit of overstatement or is it uh, really like you're the rebels in the office and you're really looking forward to changing the world? There is no question about it that we want to take our humble swipe at changing the way in which modern consumption works. We are trying to change the idea and the paradigm that better needs to cost more because there's some unconscious perception that it does and it doesn't. And we believe better everything for everyone and access to everyone. But the thing is, we understand also that not everybody has $3. And so for those that don't have $3, that's why every time you check out at brandless.com, we're providing a meal uh, to Feeding America. You know, I, you, you, you put together such an extraordinary collection of brands that you focus on an interview on your podcast, and we love it. And with the name Brandless, one would say, wait a second, what's that about? They're not a brand, but we are unapologetically a brand. We're just kind of redefining what it means to be one and where we sit in the world. So when you say, are we a movement? Are we the resistance? Viva la resistance. Like we definitely are people who believe that we can change the world by starting with everyday essentials and the things that people use every day. And we can hopefully, you know, join a movement or start a movement around the access to everything for everyone um, at fair prices. Like if that's the resistance, then sign me up. All right. And it, it sounds a bit like a David versus Big CPG story. Is, is that right? I mean, the truth is that Big CPG, it does not have a relationship with consumers. So it's not their fault. You know, they get sold through channel. They don't have a store. They don't have direct relationships. They don't, they've never met consumers. They, they might do focus groups and they might make, you know, broadcast commercials, but 
their customers are the big box retailers or the online retailers. And so we are building a community um, that's in direct relationship with the people that we serve. And in fact, not only are we in direct relationship with them, but now that we're live and we're 22, 23 weeks into this, every day we're getting, you know, we're in conversation with our early adopters and they're asking us to create certain food on the and, and, and goods and services in the assortment. So the gluten-free community um, loves us, has found us, is encouraging us to do even more. And so, you know, when people ask me, well, are you trying to take down CPG? I'm like, not at all. Like, knock yourself out. I mean, it's not my fault that the top 100 CPG brands last year, 90, were in decline. I mean, that's just the fact. So we're trying to reinvent um, a system that is kind of broken for the modern, um, the modern consumer. Okay, got it. Very heavy on mission, which is what we find with a lot of what we call the Uber brands. We got it. Democratization of goodness, no brand tax. Uh, we just talked about big CPG. We already talked about your key audiences. It seems they're very broad, right? You have no gluten. You 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 were talking a little bit about the food desert and doing away with that. You're talking about the wholesome movement. Do you focus in any way or do you say, bring it on, anyone who has requests, we listen to you? Well, I mean, we listen to everyone. So that's 100% true. We have a filter on the better for you assortment and trying to work very closely with the belief systems of our consumers. And those belief systems, some of which are dietary, right? And some of them are like belief systems that says, you know what? We shouldn't cut down trees to make toilet paper. So guess what? Our, our toilet paper and our facial tissue is tree-free. It's made from bamboo grasses and sugar cane. And some of those belief systems extend to, like, no animal testing. So all of our beauty products and, and, and personal care are cruelty-free. So it's not so much about saying, oh, any request that comes over the transom, we're going to go do. But we're listening. And we're in conversation. And we're co-creating. And we're trying to do everything that we can to give these people who don't necessarily can't find these things because they don't have access or they can't afford these things because they're so overpriced or just adore the simplicity and the UI and the UX, which is basically the package design there. We've, you know, trademarked that white box in the front. If you've seen a brand that's right. product, you see it's, it's the attributes that matter. And so when we say we're brandless, we also mean like, Hey, no false narrative, man. Like, you know, we don't have Italian gondoliers in Venice, you know, strolling down the side of our tomato sauce. The narrative is not going to be made up by madmen. It's going to be listening to our community and watching them in social and all of the pictures they send us, the recipes they send us, and making sure that they're part of the conversation. That's all right. a big part of what that means. At the end of the day, and you described it yourself at the beginning, you are, of course, doing brand building yourself just in a different way. So instead of having a gondola, you hire other agencies that do a more sleek, modernistic design. But nevertheless, you hire an agency, you pay the money. I think it's Red Antler, or at least you're on their list of clients to make a design and in that way advertise it. And yes, you sell recycled toilet paper. But on the other hand, don't you, for Not example... recycled, actually. It's made from um, bamboo grasses and... Tree free. So let me oh. be clear. Like mm. Red Antler, um, they are extraordinary people, and collaborating with them on extraordinary design and UI and UX to actually be able to scale across everything we want to do. We're not saying that we are just pulling this out of the sky. What we're saying is that the narrative, when you look at the labeling, tomato and basil sauce is tomato and basil sauce. It's not something else. It's like, it's just what matters. Like the, what you see on the front of the pack, the check marks that make it into the box are supposed to educate you on the attributes you're looking for in every product to make it easy to go from one product to the next product to the next product to find what you're looking for. Because if you go to that supermarket and you track the way people are shopping today, you can see that as their habits are changing, as their um, values are changing, as the products they're looking for are changing, they pick up every box, bottle, jar, and they like they have to turn them over, turn them sideways, step back, step forward, benchmark them against mm -hmm. other things on the shelf. Like it's hard. And what we were trying to do is reduce it to its simplest form and let you do the storytelling. Are we working with creative people? Of course we're working with creative people. We're working with awesome creative people. We're just focusing our energy on uh, building out um, 
a system that scales and is simple and educational. All right. What strikes me, at least, as, as maybe a contradiction, which is you have this ecology twist to you as well, because it's very kind of conscious urban millennial, which is one way I heard you describe the design target. But on the other hand, a lot of the direct-to-consumer delivery companies create a lot of wastage. When I look literally on my curb now, on the recycling days, it seems like the quantities have quadrupled in just the last two years because, you know, Blue Apron and maybe in the future Brandless is delivering almost on a daily basis now. How do you cope with that or is that for you a different aspect? So it's a great question and it is something that we're working very hard to make the most rational packaging and also giving you lots of ideas of what you can do with the boxes when you're done uh, <clears throat> in terms of even in our holiday lookbook all of the wrappings we taught you how to make um, beautiful placemats for your holiday table and how to recycle everything and use them in your life so i agree with you we have to get it to you And it has to come in a uh, in a form that uh, protects the goods and has a beautiful presentation and has engagement. But reducing it to the most um, minimalistic packaging is going to be a major focus for us. And, you know, at 22 weeks, we're very proud of our beginnings. And we know that that's something to always be very mindful of. But you have to remember that if something is being shipped to someone's home and that is taking the place of them driving and putting out the carbon footprint and parking and the time and the this and the that, you know, you have to look at the broader ecosystem of where the shifting habits and behaviors, if things are coming into your home, what are you not doing that you might have been doing before that might have created greater waste? So mm -hmm. I'm not, uh, so it's just something I think important to look at the broader scheme. And I do hope that you've ran this boxes um, on your curb. <laughs> Uh, what's taking you so long? <laughs> All right, good point. Now, you were talking about word of mouth and your fans kind of spreading it. What do you do actively to help with that? Is there a social media program? I know you're doing a lot of, of traditional media. I saw you on television a couple of times. What do you do to help steer the word of mouth? We have a very active community on Facebook. We have a very active community on Instagram. We have a very active community on Twitter, and so they are sharing their stories, their pictures, their recipes, and we are sharing back. So there's you know hundreds of thousands of people across all of those channels that we're engaging with like every minute of the day and night, um, just having fun, whether it's family photos or you know recipe hacks or what we call shelfies, people who are redoing their pantries and their bathrooms and their, their cupboards uh, with brandless products. Um, so we're just having so much fun engaging with that community in a conversation. And what's interesting now that the community has grown so much is that the community is actually finding like-minded folks there. So whether it's, you know, sharing gluten-free hacks or vegan, um, uh, vegan recipes and things like that, it's been a lot of fun to just see the community find each other as well. That makes sense. And it reminds me of strong communities from Lululemon to Patagonia. How did you ramp it up so fast, though? Because you've only launched in July and you've already got communities exchanging their recipes and showing their rebuilt shelves. That usually takes years to accomplish. Um, well, I, I think I'll, I'll say thank you. Um, I think because we tapped a nerve. We, this was something that was brewing for a long time, not brandless, but this pent-up um, sort of demand for access and like you said that i said the democratization of goodness like i don't know that anybody would capture that as a conscious desire or need but it was definitely an unconscious uh thing that everyone deserves it and so i would say part of the movement that we're on is the positivity movement you know it's just really being out there connecting directly with people about the stuff that they're engaged in in their everyday lives and, and hearing them and validating them and supporting them and building community in every way that I know and we know how to do it. Gotcha. Now, we talk also a lot about what we call creating truth. People talk about authenticity. They use the word real a lot, real food, real people and so on. 
And this is all about a brand actually living its mission. So you can go to their place of manufacture, to their offices, etc., and you can see, really see mission at uh, work. Is there such a place? Where would that place be for Brandless where people can really check out and experience the authenticity of your brand? Well, I would say uh, the short answer is nowhere yet other than in virtual spaces like the communities that we inhabit and we just talked about. Mm -hmm. But we do have in our office a Brandless lab and that Brandless lab is where we're prototyping what kind of physical interactions could feel like, what tastings and samplings and community gatherings and, and um, community activations and programming and content and live and bringing in chefs and cooks and all these kinds of things. Like, what does it feel like to be in this space? What does it feel like to start here and get together and then go off to work at the food bank for a couple of hours? What does it feel like to uh, be a member and, you know, get a free cup of coffee um, and have the barista know your name? What does it feel like to be seen for the very first time and to be treated uh, with the kind of kindness and, um, and humanity that we believe so deeply in our souls? And how, does that, how do we prototype that? And then what does that look like when we start to roll that out in the real world? And what's the best way to do it? So how does that work? You invite people in who don't who don't know what's going to happen to them, and then you try to overcome them with kindness. <laughs> how how does it work? Um, we just act like we act. Um, you okay. Know, there's a fun uh, there's a fun video that we don't overcome anyone with kindness. We just show up kind. Um, that's <laughs> who we are. And so join our communities on Facebook. Join our communities on Instagram. Join our communities on Twitter, and you'll see exactly what I mean. It's just we're just happy you're there. Do you see this evolving? You were talking about donating to Feeding America. Feeding America. As your brand evolves and grows and matures, do you envision something that becomes a proprietary part of your brand, something that you're going to do in terms of actionism? I'm thinking of brands like Ben and Jerry's, etc. Um, there's no question that we believe that everyone deserves better. We believe that better shouldn't cost more and that unfortunately in this country like i said not everybody has three dollars so right. we have to first identify the hungry and how do we support them but more importantly how can we every day support the idea of tangible acts of kindness and i think that starts with you and that starts with the individual so when you look at our corporate culture Our company culture is really about putting people first. And of course, we hire people for what they need to do. So we have this extraordinary team of engineers and artists and merchandisers and all kinds of people. But that's what they do. That doesn't necessarily tell you who they are. And so part of the thing that we do when you first join Brownless, we ask for two adjectives that describe who you are. And in my case, I am, you know, check passionate and check curious. So if you look at my business card, my attributes are, yeah, I'm the CEO and the co-founder, but I'm also passionate and curious. But then we go a step further. I ask everybody to set a personal intention for the year. And that's a word that is not related to your job or your deliverables or the things that you do every day. There's no KPIs. There's no metrics. It's just something that you want to achieve in the next year for yourself. Once they share that word privately with me, Then we have them share it publicly in one of our sort of every 30 day intention ceremonies. And in that ceremony, we hear what their intention is. More importantly, we hear how we as a team can support them in that intention. And then we all sign this beautiful template that uh, we then hang in the office for each person. If we model that behavior for ourselves first, and then ultimately our community, and then more importantly, our community modeling it for their community, which then models it for their community, it's this idea that everyone deserves to be seen, and everyone deserves to be treated with kindness, and everybody deserves to be, and the divisiveness that is so pervasive in our nation right now doesn't relate to us. Like, that's not who we are, and that's not our value system. Our value system is about positivity and better and the democratization of true goodness of the people of this incredible country. And so if we start there with putting people first, 
then that in and of itself is an empowering movement to go and pursue your brandless life, which may be about enhancing the environment or his brandless life, which may be about the, you know, closing the food desert and her brandless life, which might be about, you know, the homeless crisis in urban, urban America. If we believe in you and you believe in you, you can go out and live more and brand less. You talked a few times about the food deserts. It seems like the way you distribute food could lend itself to make up for that. Is there a specific program that you are doing or planning to narrow the gap when it comes to the food desert in the U.S.? You know, it's a great question. And the truth is that we ship to the 48 continental U.S. states. We ship non-perishable, so we are not doing anything in physical spaces to bring better, fresh fruits and vegetables and, you know, milks and eggs and cheese and all that to those regions because right. we're not in physical spaces. However, what we are doing, and we started doing it unconsciously, like I told you, within the first 60 hours, is we're shipping to everybody in the continental U.S., By democratizing that and creating access in neighborhoods that didn't have the access to these types of goods at these fair prices, um, I think that's just a humble beginning and uh, there's a lot more to come. Gotcha. You talked a couple of times about big retailers, big food, and you talked about the gondola. What we say is that people got to learn almost the language of marketing and branding better than the branders themselves and kind of become a little bit fed up with that. Don't you think that people increasingly hear the same kind of alternative stories now? When you talk about kindness, there is a bar that's called kind. When you talk about the ingredients are very simply put on the front of our product, I think of RX bar, which famously does that five ingredients, no more, etc. Do you think that people will equally become bored with these minimalistic do good we have a better world approaches or do you think there's something fundamentally different versus what has been done before wow what a cynical question um I i'm german you know <laughs> it's oh in my, my dna gosh. It's so sad people become you know fed up with kindness that's just i hope that never happens <laughs> i think that what you're pointing to is yes you're right the new cadre of brands that are having a, you know, an accelerated impact in the marketplace are ones that are authentic and transparent, whether it's the ingredients, whether it's the voice of the founders, they are all manifesting versions of that, which may be the era of transparency as the brand, we reimagine what it means to be a brand. And when I say we, I don't mean brandless, I mean all of them, because The truth is, it's no longer what a brand says about itself. It's more what a friend tells a friend. And so then the question is, can you control that narrative? Yes and no, but you have to appreciate that that's how brands are being built today. So if that's true, then you have to kind of be in direct conversation with the people you serve. And then they're going to tell your story because that's how it works. Mm -hmm. Last questions here around the growth. You've started out very fast and you and uh, the, your co-founder, Ido yeah, Leffler, um, yeah. you, you're pros at that. I mean, you founded a whole array of companies before. What's the vision? How fast do you need to grow? What's the goal? Um, I would say that, you know, because it's such early days, there's no question that we have the potential opportunity to change these habits and practices but you know our our goal at the highest level is to sort of reimagine modern consumption meaning like build a different kind of system that doesn't mean we're going to be the only people to execute it in fact we're following the footsteps of many of our brand tax free cousins whether it's the caspers or the warby parkers or any of these folks who are are really sort of redirecting the way consumers had discovered, explored, procured um, those types of goods in the past, they're saying, wait, we can build direct relationships. So I think, you know, our goal is to be part of that community that is trying to reimagine the way we live and shop. And we are trying to bring awesome, extraordinary products at fair prices. So, you know, that is our goal in there. And like I said, the target audience is 
everyone because everybody needs to eat and everybody needs to consume on some level. We're just trying to simplify it and make it um, better for everyone. And is there an end goal of actually being purchased by a Procter and Gamble or on the other side an Amazon? We are not thinking that way at all. We're just trying to build an extraordinary community of people who share um, our belief system and evangelize that to their communities. Uh, we're not thinking uh, about the exits. We're actually just getting started. So that would be different from previous projects or you just don't know what the exit might be yet? We're really not thinking about the exit. We're, we're 22 weeks in. So we're not, <laughs> we're only thinking about, you know, the movement and the scale and the ability to really change the way people have access to extraordinary goods at fair prices. We're not thinking, we're not investment bankers, we're builders. All right. Tina, thanks so much for this very open discussion. I think it was very insightful. The speed with which you find your fans is, uh, is just amazing. So you might just be onto something. If people now after listening to this want to know more about Brandless, I guess they should go on your website. Is there another place they might want to go? I would say brandless.com is the very best place. And I would also say that the very best way to experience brandless is to order a bundle of brandless goodness because I guarantee you, um, you're already using so many of the extraordinary things, but you may not have, your olive oils may not yet be organic, your peanut butter may not yet be organic, your Toilet paper may not be tree free. So use the code hello and for your first order, it's one dollar shipping and you know try brandless and let me know what you think. Um, I'm Tina at brandless.com. Just send me a note. Here we go. I hope you're gonna get a lot of notes. And you, dear listener, you can always reach us at info at uberbrands.com and that's written with a UE as it should be by the way. If you like the podcast, tell us about it, rate it, tell your friends just like you would tell about Brandless. And with that, thanks again a lot, Tina, for being on the show. My pleasure. Thank you so much for having me and I'm waiting for an email from you after you get your, uh, your Brandless box. <laughs> All right. 